You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 221 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by HandsOnGloves.com, the all-in-one revolutionary bathing, grooming gloves. And Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network. And today, we hear from our Monty Roberts Advanced Instructor, Denise Heinlein. You've heard from her before, but this time, we get to hear her views about the advanced course and actually from one of her Brazilian students who passed the exams, too. So it's pretty fun. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, as always, Jen, with me today. Hi, Jen. Greetings, Debbie. How's it going? Oh, good. Coast to coast. How are you? I'm doing great. You've had one heck of a busy autumn out there at Flag is Up Farms. Are, does it slow down at all once you get into December? The the funny the only thing that puts brakes on around here it's hilarious is a bit of a threat of rain <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a threat of rain oh my gosh there's a cloud oh, it's, it's so funny I mean this lady has been trying to get her horse in for training here we want to start him here a beautiful big he's a, he's a Dutch warm blood and she's been growing him up and he's all mature now and ready to go and she said. Um, can you pick him up December 1? So this was early November. And I said, well, of course we can. Yep. Uh, well, he's never been trailered before. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for the warning on that. And, uh, you know, and we'll we'll bring our brightest and best and our dually halter and away we go. So we uh, are about two days out. So I thought I better call her and, you know, make plans. She went, oh, no, 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 no. There's, there's a chance of rain on Thursday. That's December 1. And I went, uh, okay. Like chances of rain around here, <laughs> it is big news, but it doesn't mean it happens. First of all, and I went, okay. And second of all, she lives 15 minutes away. I mean, oh my literally 15 minutes away, <laughs> just about, you know, one little village over. So I said, well, okay, so we'll, we'll cancel that and we'll come on a Saturday. So anyway, yes, that's the only thing that slows us down, Jen. That's <laughs> it's amazing. It's a bit of a threat of rain. <laughs> there's, a, there's a cloud. Oh, no. Yeah, better back her down Earth, here. Earthquake, no problem. We can Take deal with cover. that. Take cover. Yeah, earthquakes, uh, that happens really <laughs> quick. <laughs> oh, anyway, wow. no, we're really busy here. We're happy busy, though. We're doing a lot of things. We have put in nearly, we're shy three of, 27 walkouts since Explain September Explain to everybody 1. what a walkout is. Yeah, I know. Everybody's got different names for it. I like the calm, chill feeling you get when you say walk out. Now, some people call them run-ins, <laughs> and that always makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we took and retrofitted our stalls or barns that have the typical 12 by 12 we have nice tongue and groove, beautiful barns built and everything, but they have no hole in the back. So we put holes in the walls and we built extra tall doors and we tacked on oil field reclaimed pipe. They're big, beautiful pipe that is usually tossed away after the oil companies have put it out there for a while. And they are sturdy and wonderful. And our gorgeous welder carrot has made magic out there and 12 by 24 and they can play lip tag over the so, so what, we have so what you did was you have this lovely 12 by 12 stall that's attached to its very own personal personal pizza size paddock that's good yes is that kind of how it works yeah exactly and those are up against each other now some people will not like that they like to have a little gap in between but i purposefully don't like that. I don't want that. I actually want them to be social, but it does take some doing then, doesn't it? Because we do have to see who's compatible and who will, you know, settle who, down. Who plays nicely. Yeah. Who plays nicely with each other, who doesn't get extremely bonded up in 48 hours. That happened. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so there's all those dynamics too. I don't care if you're an 18 year old gelding. Sometimes you still get bonded up with a yes, cute little mayor that went in there like, what a mayor. So yeah, there was all that going on too. So it's really fun. It's, it's fun to see the equine behavior 
modifications going on and um, in the training and the mountain trail. Irony is not lost on me with the mountain trail, speaking of rain, because we do have one coming up this Saturday. By the time this comes out, it will have been passed, but it might be rescheduled because what happens on a mountain trail? Well, occasionally it rains. And so everybody's like, ah, I can't go on the mountain trail. It's going to rain. <laughs> <laughs> irony I'm so uh yeah that's that's us californians sorry don't tease us there we go see here in florida that type of accommodation is typically called a run out okay run out yeah so i've heard run ins run run out is better i guess mm-hmm. for me but i kind of like them to walk out <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah there you go walk outs okay so so that way the horse has better movement. He has better socialization. Uh He's got better fresh air because he's not in an enclosed area where we're going to have harmful things like dust and ammonia building up. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. How how many, about how many stalls have you converted into this system? Yeah, 27. Well, there's three stalls left that have a few little odds and ends to do on them. But 27 is what we um, will finish with, at least for now. That's the first phase. And uh, and that's, uh, that's actually underestimating our buildings because two of those buildings have at least 10 stalls converted, actually 21 if I totaled the two buildings, converted to loafing areas, lounging areas, lying areas. People call those things different things too, where we put this thick matting, stable comfort matting in there and though, and no food and no water. It's outside. So these are in herd dynamics where we've got a couple acres attached to those and they're turned out in six or eight uh, groups. So there will be geldings and mares in different areas. And that's a that's another way we're using the buildings too. So we, we talked about yeah, Very we talked cool. about that at the movement, and we'll talk more about it as the years go on because we're starting to get a lot of curiosity about those, too. Yeah. Oh, so speaking have, of the movement, we haven't talked mm-hmm. about that for a minute. For somebody who wants to tune in to what happened at the movement this year or in previous, where do they go to find that? You're so mm-hmm. kind. Thank you. Yeah, we do. We filmed them all. And if you go to MontyRoberts.com, MontyRoberts.com, so M-O-N-T-Y, there is a, let's see, how do we put it, online lessons, outreach, shop. There is a Vimeo on demand. I think it's under shop. If you put it in the search bar <laughs> and put Vimeo in there, yeah, they're, they are filmed and uploaded to a Vimeo site. And I think the trick is, I think they're $9.99 for the entire thing, though. I mean, you get to see the whole, whether it was the live weekend, stream. Yeah. yeah, it's a whole, yeah, three days. So, uh, yeah, it's a pretty good deal if you couldn't make it to the, I highly recommend coming live and in person yeah. to the movement. But if you can't do that, then they can go back to the archives and, and see the Vimeo on there. So the, the easiest way to find the 2022 version is just go to MontyRoberts.com mm-hmm. and in the top right-hand corner under shop, there's a drop-down menu and you just drive down to special events and it's right there. There it is, DVD and streaming. Thank yep. you so much. There you go. Much so better. check yep. that out. It's got all kinds of great stuff in it all about Monty Roberts' methods and Equus you know, Online University. But it also has a little tour of all of the great upgraded facilities that you're putting in there under the California Horse Center. Yeah, California Horse Center, because we're not just thoroughbreds anymore. Flag is up farms is and always will be our legendary, iconic, original 1966 farm. But we also put on top of that the California Horse Center, which has the mountain trail that we were talking about, these these new facilities, new living quarters, you know, way, ways of keeping horses healthier, lots more turnouts. We've converted some um, extra things into turnouts now with oil filled pipe again. And we put in an, another round pin. You haven't seen that one yet, Jen. No another 50 foot round pin um, on a grid, eco green grid, which is just great stuff with uh a road base and a rock dust and then sand on top. They're beautiful panel. And so, yeah, we're really excited. We just keep like uh, Winchester house. We just keep adding on. Building. <laughs> and for those of you on the East coast yes. are currently horrified at somebody saying oil field pipe, oil ah. field pipe. For those of us who have not been initiated, it's the standard product that mm-hmm. big farms use out in your part of the country to create pipe fencing. 
Mm-hmm. And Kentucky too. It's, it's yeah. Well it's known. it's not anything weird or foreign. It's normal. So don't freak out, those of you, <laughs> Thank you for in wooden that. fencing territory. Yeah, no, we're really proud of it because it's hard to get really good quality oil field pipe. It's such in demand out here. It welds beautifully. It holds up beautifully. It, and yeah, and we put paneling in horse panels, uh, you know, inside too. So yeah, they're just like. I, I'm going to live here a long time. So we, we, we did it for <laughs> our it kids and generations <laughs> to come too. Cause they're really nice. Yeah. Building it to stay. Well, enough catching up. We have to get to our first guest who is Denise Highline. And uh, she's, she is the person who took care of the exams this last time around that we've been talking about for a while. But before we do that, we're going to chat a little bit about hands on gloves. <music> Our title sponsor, Hands On Gloves, who support us and are our reason for being here, I actually have a little innovation that you were telling me about with Nigel. Yes, Nigel. This was inspired. I was watching some of the videos over on the Hands On Gloves YouTube page. That's cool. Yeah. And it has great ideas for using your hands on gloves if you ever want to spend a little time on YouTube. And who doesn't want to do that? In in the wintertime, Nigel does not get clipped because his hair coat doesn't really get very thick and he lives out of doors. It's a, it's a very light winter coat, and that's a real struggle in the winter because you want to get deep down into the hair when you dry them off because what can happen is you can get rain rot yep. if the top of the hair dries before the skin does. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And we've all used towels to dry our horses off. You squ- scrape back and forth. But that's it, it doesn't get to the skin. It only, it only dries the top. It does. So... You take the old hands-on gloves, which you've got on anyway, because that's what you were using to scrub you your horse. You washed it with. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Just grab a towel, toss it on your horse, and you dry the horse using your gloved hand. And those little bumples on the gloves get down between the hairs and dry the skin off. It's yeah. awesome. It's awesome. And they love it. I mean, who doesn't like to be snuggled in a blankie? <laughs> if you give them a good once-over with a towel... And your hands yes. on glove. Then yep. when you do throw the cooler over top, you've lo- you've fluffed up all that hair. Yes. So that it can allow the moisture from the skin to come up through. If the hair's mushed down flat, it's going to do its job of keeping things just the way they are. So exactly. grab yourself a pair of hands on gloves from handsongloves.com or your mm-hmm. local tack retailer. You can find them everywhere. They everywhere. come in lots of different sizes and colors. Yep. And give it a try for yourself. Denise Heinlein has loved horses since she was five years old. She's traveled the world training horses and has settled in California as a specialist in teaching students to gentle horses and to help horses overcome phobias and remedial issues. After teaching classes and courses in Germany and getting a lot of experience in the thoroughbred industry, she is teaching now at the Monty Roberts International Learning Center, but wait, update, she's also creating the Monty Roberts Learning Center Europe. Well, welcome back, Denise Heinlein. You've always been a highlight of our years over, we've done this for years now, where you've done uh, not only interviews about specific courses, but also interviews about specific work that you've done with Monty's Concepts and with your training. You have such a breadth and knowledge of horsemanship that you brought to this school and then continuing it on with the advancing through your courses, becoming a certified instructor, and then eventually teaching, which we know is the ultimate test of how much you know about the concepts is how well you teach it. And you are at the top of Monty's system of teaching. And so we're really excited. And we're going to come back and probably talk a little bit about what you're going to do in Europe. We've got some great plans there, but let's cook those a little bit first and see how far we get. And then we'll, we'll do an interview about that too. Right now, what I wanted to do is I, it was fascinating to watch you as you as you held the advanced course exams here. And we had some nervous students. We had some excited students. And we had a cross spectrum of horsemanship, probably as broad as, as you've ever seen, I would think. Um, tell us a little bit about the breadth and depth of the horsemanship that came in there. For how many students did you have? I had seven students from all around the world again, which is always so fascinating to see how Monty's concepts bring in this pool of people who are like-minded and want to have, you know, the best what they can give back to their horses and especially to their countries of, you know, better 
the horsemanship there. So that was lovely to have everybody back to want to go on in our education. I think like the advanced exams, these are challenging because we ask our students not to necessarily repeat or copy any of methodology. We want them to be as far in their understanding that they actually can speak equals the nonverbal communication system of horses pretty fluently, which means that they are having horses here, we give them, um, which they haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. So now I ask them to go in there and start their dialogue of getting to know each other and um, t teaching the horse to accept all of those new things, which they don't know. So it's going to be... Uh, Yeah, a pretty nice examination of the students, how fluently they are actually in equus. How fluently do they speak with the horse so that they get all of those little, you know, comments and um, things the horses want to tell them and if they can pick it up or if they're still, you know, busy with vocabulary mm -hmm. um, kind of thinking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's like learning a new language, isn't it? That when we first go to a country, we might know, um, what's your name? My name is, where's the bathroom? <laughs> How far to a gas station? You know, some of that stuff. But I think what you're saying is as you get nuancy and you really learn the ins and outs of the particular feelings that you put into your communication or the way your style of speaking to the horse. But do horses speak the same language to everyone? Yeah, they are very true in their um, communication system. So they tell you exactly um, if there's tension or relaxation, if they understood something or if we need to repeat it or phrase it differently for them. So they actually then understand what we want of them or, or ask them to learn. And yeah, I think all over the world, I mean, wherever I've been, horses talk the same nonverbal language. So therefore, once you learn it, you can speak with the horses globally in the same, yeah. you know, attitude with the same outcome, because you're just able to pick up every little thing they need us to know about them. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever they are ready mm -hmm. to go the next step, or if they have like a little bit worry still, and we have to repeat to show them that there is actually nothing to worry and to really break it into a very incremental steps with some horses because they tell us they need it. And some other horses tell us they are very bored if we do so, <laughs> yeah. because then their mind is like occupied on some other things. So it's really that important um, in the advanced exam to see how far our students are, mm -hmm. you know, in understanding the language um, of the horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you did, as you said, not only were they varied in that they came from all over the world, but they were varied in experience, how long they had worked with horses, some very green and some very advanced. Um, we had one that um, here for the course too. So right after you had the exams, you had a course with three more students. One guy had won um, a makeover, you know, with I think feral horses, Mustang horses like. Um, and, and it is fascinating to watch how you teach each person to read the horse. I think probably that's even from a, a standpoint of somebody who doesn't know much about horses could listen to you and understand that you're teaching people And we're all just people carnivores <laughs> reading a horse, but teaching to read the horse. So now that we've got the advanced exams under our belt, what happens with those students? They are hopefully going back uh, to their countries on their places to practice more, you know. So it means like they should keep their ability to talk and um, be with horses like very up to date. So instead of going home and be happy that they, you know, got the first um, yeah. 
tick off the box by um, passing or not passing the advance exam, they should continue to uh, practice and, and work with horses. At the end, they are our best professors because they are really fluent. It's natural to them to speak their own language. And therefore, the more time we spend with them, the better we get in the dialogue to speak with them. It's the same for me when I'm here in America longer, I get better <laughs> in my um, English or with speaking English. And then when I'm back home and I don't practice or I don't have to speak for a long time, I'm get really rusty at it. So yeah. I assume it is almost the same as we speak like a gesture in nonverbal communication. No, other way around. There you go. Now I thought German and it messes my mind up. <laughs> But yeah, so I think um, to go home and practice more, that's the key factor to go and get as good as you can and then come back um, where we have our internship program, where they learn how to teach those concepts and you can only teach what you know. Mm. And um, this mm. is a little bit the fact, if you don't know what you're missing, you don't know. <laughs> and therefore yeah. you need to be out there, you know, yeah. to get all of the experiences that once you ha you have made this experience and you know what you're talking about, yeah. this is then how you can transport it into your teaching mm -hmm. and tell people where they have to make like kind of fine little nuances. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's so. This very is what important. they're yeah, very important. And this is what you send them home with. Is please, please go home, find horses to practice with, and practice your language. Yeah, exactly. Pra practice equus. So what would you say their strengths and weaknesses are? What would you like to see them practicing besides just being around horses and, and working with them? What, what did you tell these particular people to work on? What did they focus on? I think we always need to focus on ourselves means that we need to focus on being aware what our body actually does. You know, sometimes we focus too much on our mind and the thought process that we forget what our physics and um, the body is actually um, telling opposite mm -hmm. uh, into the opposite. Yeah. So we need to really know how to be in <laughs> ones with our thoughts and our body. So they do the same. Yeah. And um, often it happens that, uh, you know, my students now, even at the advanced exam, they, they make a move and then they are surprised that the horse reacted on it. Um, which shouldn't happen anymore. You know, you should know that much about the language of the horse that you know that every single um, movement mm -hmm. we do has something to say. Yeah. And um, so that's number one, to really be aware of their own body language. And if they are, you know, having rough movements, they need to learn how to um, get very nice and soft with it. Doesn't mean that's slow, but it's just a way how Monty always says to move as you would be in heavy oil with, or flow. like flow, like yeah. Tai Chi, everything yeah. like mm -hmm. kind of controlled and, um, you know, in place. And that's the part number one. Okay. And then, of course, to be able to pick up all of those tiny little details, mm -hmm. because the less you have to be occupied with your own uh, body and mm -hmm. thought and what's coming next, um, the better you can observe your horse. Mm -hmm. And in that moment where you can just let your body do it because you have everything in muscle memory, mm -hmm. that's when you get really good in reading the horses because your mind is only set up to read and mm -hmm. see all of the tiny gestures the horses are giving us. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, that comes only with practicing mm -hmm. and being out there. That's it. Like, I don't have to think when I drive from here to the grocery store, I don't think much about my skill sets <laughs> behind the, the wheel, right? I don't think about breathing. Uh, it, it, it is something we've always done. I think that's where you're going is that make it second nature, in your body and watch your horse so that if he is flinching, you know, you're moving too quickly. You're doing something to make him uncomfortable. Uh, so what, what do you think these, uh, this group excelled in? What did you, what surprised you about? Them? Well, they all have had like the right attitude at it. Mm -hmm. You know, they were all there to keep on learning instead of only thinking they have to uh, succeed in a test they saw it, what it was actually to keep still 
practicing and learning and working together with their horses. So I like that very much that they stayed really true to the moment with their horses. And they already proven to us that they are pretty good in equus. And I think everybody saw from uh, from the exam week that this is not the end. <laughs> you know, it's just the start. As everybody who is passing the university, they are just starting now to get into their um, profession. So, and throughout the years in their professions, they work themselves into expertise. So therefore, I think everybody realized that, you know, in here, so that they do have a good base mm -hmm. and there's so much more to learn. Mm, I that's mean, such a good point. Yeah. We always, every single day and every horse we get, we keep on learning and, you know, kind of fine tuning our um, expertise. Yeah. It, really, it is that. I mean, dad, mm -hmm. dad is still learning. He, he put together the Equus Online University so that he could impart movement from his body onto video so that people could see that. But he doesn't always understand each move that he makes either. Um, he, you know, he sometimes says, really, I do that? Because it isn't always obvious to us until we see video of ourselves or somebody else doing it before we actually learn those um, nuances. And I think that's what you're talking about, nuances. And what a good point that these people have received an education, but it's just the beginning of their career, with these horses. What a great admonition to always stay a student and become better with horses because they do make us better as people too. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for the send off. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for um, having me here again. And yeah, I'm looking forward, you know, to see them all come back and, um, you know, being an intern and keep on learning and keep on getting better. I think they will. Thanks. Definitely. Thanks, Denise Heinlein. Thanks for joining us on Horsemanship Radio. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it, too, on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online, too, on our forum. And there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. Valdo Junqueros Franco founded an IT company, Broad PC, 20 years ago in the competitive Southern California area after moving from Brazil. His talents are in progressive methods of technology and efficiency. Beatrice, his wife, has been a part of the building of their business, too. Now, 20 years later, his success has allowed him the time to get back into horses, but in a big way. He's starting seven wild horses on his family farm in Brazil. Well, welcome. We've got Valdo Franco. I, I think I can say it now. I think the word is out. Newly minted, certified Monty Roberts instructor. I'm so proud of you. How are you? Hey, Debbie. I'm doing great. And I'm super excited and happy that I finally got to this stage of this journey and I passed the advanced exam. So it's a great moment in my life and my wife's life, you know. I should say, there are two in the family that passed on this same week, which is just amazing to me because some people know your story and some people don't. Give us a quick synopsis of the Bia and Valdo story. So um, my wife and I walked in here because we had some horses in Brazil that were untouched for a while. And during the pandemic, we were going to go spend nine months in Brazil because we now live in Long Beach. And, and I told my wife, I said, look, we got to get someone to break those horses in Brazil. <laughs> and in Brazil is expensive. You pay a monthly salary. And we had like seven horses that needed to be worked on. And then I went to the internet of how to break a horse. That's all I knew, right? The word breaking. I didn't know anything else. Um, and then I found Monty Roberts and, and, I, and I found this new way that I had never heard of, of gently a horse, uh, without any violence, without a twitch, without what I had seen in my childhood back in Brazil. I said, what if I could do this? I don't have to hire anyone that's going to do violence in our horses. And I Google and I saw a module three was going on on a course at Flags Up Farm. I told my wife, I said, baby, 
we're late. There's this place in California, they're already on module three, and we got to go next week. And we came here for a three-day weekend course of long lining. And it was a mind-blowing experience the moment you enter this farm, the moment you go through the door. It's an amazing atmosphere. And then we had these wonderful sessions. And then on Monday, they were going to start a gently wild horse course. And I'm like, babe, that's what I'm looking for. That's how to gentle a horse. You know, and we came here for three days and we stayed 18 days straight. I had to call my parents and say, hey, can you stay with our kids a little longer? Just a couple more weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's how we got started. It yeah. was an amazing time. It, it, was a, it was a crazy time. As I recall, it, we're, well, we're certainly in the middle of COVID, which was a little crazy. And um, here are these two Brazilians that show up and one says she's afraid of horses and the other one says, I'm an IT guy from Long Beach, but, you know, I'm going to start all these horses down in Brazil. <laughs> and I thought, you know, every Brazilian I think I've ever met has sort of a like a little wild side to them. <laughs> it's true. And I was just, uh, I was excited to see that, you know, you were, you were bold enough to do it. And now here you are. So a couple of things we've already interviewed you once because of your unique story, but what we haven't, um, we haven't interviewed you first since you just graduated. So now I can say, congratulations, you're a newly minted instructor, but what, what was this last week of exams like? Debbie, it's been, the week of the most nerve wracking that I can remember since in adulthood, because you, you know, you're tested, uh, the pressure's on, you got a horse for five days, you got 30 minutes only with that horse that never had a saddle on, that it's been barely touched. I mean, it's been a uh, halter broken. He has had the first halter on, but it doesn't know the saddle. It doesn't know how to lead on the duty and you got, Half hour, uh, half hour sessions in four days. And on the fifth day, you got to show that a horse can take a saddle, that you can lead him, that you can long lining. And, and I started my first session. I had a horrible, terrible first session. I was like a chicken running over my head looking for the horse. I released my horse. I could never catch the horse on the round pin my first session. And I was like terrified. And the next days, you know, I was nervous, I was under pressure, I was shaking, but, you know, I concentrated. I knew I've had got the proper training over here along the last few years. Um, I just used the concepts I learned. Uh, you know, I I read the horse as much as I could read the horse. And, and I, I felt like a Formula One driver when you have... Uh, before the Sunday run, yeah. you have a bad training, a bad star training. And, and you know, when you like, but then I thought of Lewis Hamilton and Schumacher. I said, these guys, sometimes they're in last and they come back and mm -hmm. pick it up. And that's how, that was my mindset. I'm going to turn this around. And, you know, I did turn it around. I had an amazing session. My horse was calm. I was calm the last day and everything worked out. And, and I saw the smile on the face of the instructors because it, it means what they taught me. I learned and was able to process. And it's been a crazy, amazing journey. And, and I'll tell you, it's a lot of written exams and you got your presentation. And um, But we prepared and we worked hard for it, my wife and I. And uh, we're thrilled to have achieved this. Mm. Well, you should be. It's rare air. I like to tell people that certified instructors um, are hard to come by. People who know us know that there are very few in the United States. Now you're going to go off and be in Brazil. <laughs> we lost you on this one. But um, there are very few in the United States. I think it's because, number one, a lot of people hold on to tradition, don't they? And that's it's hard for people to lose that from their muscle memory if they were raised with traditional methods. So compare what you think you've heard about traditional methods in the United States with what you've seen in Brazil. So um, I mostly have seen traditional methods in Brazil, right? I've seen, in fact, during my childhood, and I moved to the U.S. when I was 19 years old, I only saw the use of whip to make a horse run. I've never seen anything unlikely that until I came to Monte. So the first thing you learn here, you never use a whip. There's no need. There's no need for force. One thing I remember when I was a kid at my grandfather's farm or ranch uh, is that I remember one time they're using this wooden pole with a little rope at the end, which was called a twitch. 
and I remember they're twitching the horse um, front lip, front mm -hmm. lip, and mm -hmm. um, and that didn't look good. And I remember I saw once in my childhood, and I remember to this date that scene, and you know, coming here and learning that. In fact, what I want to do is bring that to Brazilian uneducated cowboys of ranch and farmers and show them, look, you can start a horse another way. You don't need a whip. You don't need a twitch. You don't need violence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, it, with these concepts I learned here about pressure and release, about stimuli, and like when the horse relaxes, you take the pressure, the stimuli away. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a bit scared of horse because, you know, it's been, it was so many years I wasn't using horse on a, you know, monthly basis or something. But once you learn that the horse is not out there to, to get you, he's just scared. He sees a new balloon, he's scared. He sees you for the first time, he's scared. You're going to touch him, he's scared. He thinks your hand is going to kill him. He thinks the, the rope or a balloon is going to kill him. And once you start showing, look, let me show the balloon. Now I take it away. Let me show you again. Now I take it away. And eventually he gets the habituation. Okay, it's just a balloon. It's not going to kill me. Mm -hmm. And and. A lot of people have no idea that all the horse is doing, he's terrified. He thinks it's a snake. It's going to bite them. Mm -hmm. It's just because, uh, like Monty uh, taught us, a horse is neophobic. Mm -hmm. Anything new to the horse, yeah. they think it's out to get them. They have and to one, be afraid. Yeah. And once you show them, because they're flight animals, the first thing they have to do is run, then assess. Is this danger or is it not danger? That's right. And uh, those are the things I learned. And one of the most important things I learned is that the horse are into pressure animals. You know, like when they say if they're going to a narrow door and they bump on the door, the next time they go in, they bump into they bump into it a lot harder because they're into pressure animals. Because that's how they did when an animal in the past uh, bite their flanks. They would lean to the animal instead of instead of running, because if they ran, they would open their flanks open, yeah. right? So that's where it starts, the, the into pressure, right? Um, from, so all this learning is very interesting. You know, you, you press the horse with your leg, he's going to lean to your leg. So you can use a uh, tool like the top pole to teach him to move away from pressure. Um, so it's all about the pressure release and the picnic, right? Yeah. Um, Positive instant consequences, negative instant consequences. That's good. You've learned your lessons well. Obviously, you've passed your advanced exams, uh, written and um, practicals out in the gentling pen. Tell us a little bit about that gentling session that goes on out there. You know, the, the gentling, then it's not, in my view, it's not as pressured as your starter. Because not only you're working on a team, the pressure is not only in you, mm -hmm. it, it's at least in two people. Our group, we were in three. So first of all, the pressure is in three. And as a team, we can always go further. So that's how it's been in my business career. As a team, I think the gentling sessions was were more relaxed. I had fun because I love to start the horses. That's why I came here in the first mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the pro and the progress and how the gentlers teach you because it's one wrong move. You know, I'm a fast mover. I'm a guy that go get things done and I'm quick. And and sometimes I move too quick for a gentler. And the horse shows you, come back slowly on me. I may give you my attention, you know. So it, it teaches how to move, how to approach them. Again, you got the pressure and release at the right timing, like Monty says. If learning is one to 10, the most important learning is zero to one, meaning that first step, the horse takes on the right direction. You need to recognize it yes. and say good job to the horse, right? Or that's the right path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the gentler was a lot more fun for me. Yeah. Tell, tell me about the horse that you use for the starter then. Was this a, do you know where it came from? Anything about it? The horse I used uh, came from maybe it's Oak Three uh, oh, Rescue Oakdale. Center. Oak so a rescue center, yeah. Oakdale. Mm -hmm. um, so Oakdale, that horse had been beaten mm -hmm. on the front of their on of his face of her face. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a ten year old. Um, this mare was like beaten pretty hard. It's got a huge, huge scar on the face, and and because of that, you could not touch. Her head could not grab her on the halter. So 
on the first day. No wonder I couldn't catch her on the round pen. And, and I had a hard time on, to catch on the stall. But then I used a lot of pressure release and a lot of rubbing and rewarding for her to be near me, to let me touch her head. And, and at the end, I could catch her. She joined up with me beautifully. She, you know, I gave her some quality time at the end of the session and she came to me and, and I go to the stall. She walks into me now and I can go to her head straight as well. So it was a wonderful experience with that horse. She didn't know how to turn to the side I wanted her to turn and she learned and it's a very smart horse. It's mm-hmm. unbelievable. Um, I, I want to take her home. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody says that. We have more quarantine horses that way. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had a class. Uh, this class was seven. We had one from Hungary, two from Germany, one from England. Uh, our instructor was from Germany and Simon from South Africa, actually, originally. Who am I missing? And, and two from Brazil. And, and let me talk about your instructors. What a wonderful journey. Simon's a great guy. Denise is a great girl. Like they're great instructors. They support you along the way. They will shape you. You know, they'll drive you mad. They'll make you happy. It's all part of learning. Like every instructors you have, but man, they know how to teach you and they know how to shape you. Um, and they're the reason I passed today. You know, because they taught me right and they supported me all the way here. Um, so. I highly recommend if anyone wanted to take uh, some lessons with horse, this is the journey and the place to be. It is a lot of fun. Yeah. So we'd remit, be remiss if I didn't ask you, what are you going to do with your certification now? And what, I mean, you talked about some of the horses on your ranch, your grandfather's ranch originally, and now off to you and you're responsible for these horses there. Um, what's the larger impact though? So what we really would like to do, uh, like I said earlier, we would like to administer classes in our range. Uh, we would like to show Monty's method at the rodeo, the rodeo festival in our town. We have one of the largest rodeo events in the world. Um, we have been offered even their facilities for us to use to do Monty's clinic and show Monty's methods. Uh, we have their support. So we would like to show We'd like to use the road. We'd like to use our region, which is really famous for agriculture stuff, to help spread Monty's methods. I personally would like to start some courses for uneducated cowboys, like I said earlier, and say, look, you're going to start a horse. Let me just show you. Mm -hmm. You can start like this instead of the traditional methods you're used to. And, you know, keep in mind that if you use this method, maybe you'll be less injured. And if you're less injured... That means you can do more horses and make more money because these people, sometimes all they have is their profession to make money. And that's the only way I know. I say, if I show you a better way, maybe you can do more horses because you're not going to be hurt. And if you can do more horses, you may be able to do more money for yourself. Mm -hmm. And and my wife would probably, well, she she does want to get more into the... um, like a uh, horse sense healing, like on the lead up, uh, you know, working with children and, and community, um, letting the horse show people some leadership. So we do want to work with children in need as well. But most importantly, we want to show Monte's method um, to help the Brazilian yeah. community to know there's a better way of doing work with your horse in most importantly, we also, not most importantly, but we also want to have more women involved in starting horses because in Brazil it is known that horse, to start a horse is just for violent or, you know, strong men. Mm-hmm. And to my surprise, when I got in class first day here, where are the guys? There's no guys in class. It's just girls, right? Um, and my wife's a great example of a Brazilian lady that, uh, was scared of horses and she can start a horse on her own now. And we want to show that to other Brazilian women and say, look, you too can start a horse, not a men business. Yeah. It's men and women business and yeah. you too can do it. Why do you think that is though? That, it, um, I, I think it's a strength thing. A lot of people think that you, if you have to overpower a horse, then you're going to have to be a big burly guy to do it. But these concepts don't require that, do they? No, Debbie. And it's funny you mentioned that because, my first 
personal thought to myself when I saw Monty. And of course, you know, he is the man who listened to horses. But when I saw that uh, man, 85 years old, I said, you know, I'm skinny. I'm not a strong guy. I am skinny. I've always been skinny. I'm, you know, I'm a short guy. And I said, hey, I cannot do a horse, right? I'm like too skinny or something. When I saw Monty, 85 years old, I said, what if you get kicked? I mean, I said, you know, I don't know, nothing compared to him, but I think looking at his size and his age, well, I, I could probably do it, right? <laughs> Even though I'm a skinny guy. And, and then you learn. As long as you know what you're doing with the proper methods, it's not about size or strength mm -hmm. or gender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's being in the right place at the right time. And the only way you know that is that you've read your horse. Um, your pulse rate is low, so you're not making mistakes where you're, you know, you've got that glazed over look. And it's the same with horses, too. I think the more relaxed we are, certainly the horses sync with us. But I think they're more confident, too, when you're confident. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. You know, horse will sync with you and you have to be calm. And, and I'll tell you, during my session, some days I was shaking. I was extremely nervous. And when I went to the last session with... I wasn't nervous of whatsoever. I, I don't even know how I was so calm. I'm not usually that calm in my life. But when I did connect with that horse and I went in calm as it was no big deal, I was worried about the horse. What does he need? We connected so well and everything went amazing in my view. Well, that's exactly why I think and everybody else probably listening to this podcast think that horses are therapeutic. They actually reflect so much of what we either need or what we're doing and demonstrating. So we're so happy to have you. High five. <laughs> Thank you, baby. High five for, for all the things that you're doing, not only being a very smart person who's going to go down there and build a, a nice uh, repertoire of talents and abilities to help influence those people. But you do, you you are um, in the midst of the biggest rodeo, um, the Bajetos. Yes. Um, and we're, we're really excited how many people you can influence by showing, just demonstrating the concept. It doesn't take much convincing once horses are honest, aren't they? They can't tell a lie. So when you see a horse go from fractious to calm and following up, it's amazing. And I don't think... Anybody thinks they can fake that very well, right? I agree. I couldn't agree more. And, and my study material is one of the things that Monty says, let the horse do the talking. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people may not believe you or if you tell them they should do something different with their horse. Instead, just let your work, let the horse show your work and they'll come to you. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the Dear Monty, why do you dislike single line lunging? Monty's reply, it is my strong belief that single line lunging is the second worst piece of horsemanship on earth, second only to striking a horse to produce pain. I know this is a bitter pill for many people, but if you consider the matter properly, you can only conclude that I am right. In demonstrations, I consistently show how horses that have been single line lunged for significant amounts of times are truly habituated to a pattern of travel that is injurious to mind and body. Every horse that a single line lunged for more than 30 days or so will travel with its head to the outside of the circle. This one act sets the pattern for complete anatomical malfunction. Once the head is outside the circle of travel, the spine must then take a curve opposite to the circumference of the circle on which the horse is traveling. When the spine is curved inappropriately, then the pelvis attachment and the shoulders are acting in an uncoordinated fashion. What this means is that two main muscle masses of the horse's anatomy are working one against the other, while they should be assisting one another in harmonious effort. I use a surcingle with side reins that have elastic in them. Schooling the horse to travel with his head directly in front or slightly inward to the circle, I gradually tighten the side reins until I achieve bilateral symmetry. 
At this point, I put two lines on the horse so that I eliminate the weight of one line attached to the horse's head. With two lines, I can easily control the rear leads so that the horse does not travel disunited. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. In January, we've got our Mountain Play Day on January 14 and then January 21, Horsemanship 101. And then February 4, Mountain Trail Play Day. Then February 6 through 10 is our Gentling Wild Horse class. So that's five days. 13 through 25 will be the introductory course of horsemanship. And then that'll be broken up into modular. So 13 through 15 is module one, first steps to Monty's methods. 16 through 18 is the module two, which is join up. 20 through 22 is the module three, long lining. And then 23 to 25, if you've taken all three of those, you'll be ready for preparation for the intro exams, module four. Then in March, long-term thinking, Horsemanship 101, that's March 11th. And we are very full right now in January with Horsemanship 101. So if you don't get your slot on January 21, I think there's only a slot or two left, then sign up for that March 11th Horsemanship 101. And then March 13th through 17th is Monty's special training. We always do filming. Those are some extraordinary horses that we bring in for that. So that's March 13th through 17th. And then the 18th is a Mountain Trail Play Day. We'll stop there. Woohoo! And you can find mm-hmm. all of this and more on the website, MontyRoberts.com. And by the way, this here podcast is also available at MontyRoberts.com. It's right there on the homepage. Just scroll down a little bit. You can also call Flag is Up Farms and speak with a lovely, intelligent, knowledgeable human being at 805-688-6288. And for details about today's show, you can go to <laughs> MontyRoberts.com, as I said. You can also go to HorsemanshipRadio.com. There you're going to find links, photos, and more information about today's guests and topics. And if you haven't done so already and you haven't, shame on you, you need to join Monty Roberts on social media. His Facebook page, Monty Roberts, the one with a little blue check mark. On Twitter, Monty is Monty underscore Roberts and the same for Instagram. Mm -hmm. That's true. And many thanks to our sponsors, too. That's handsongloves.com and then montyrobertsuniversity.com. Both are my favorites. Uh, I'm loving them. And advance notice, if you've gotten this far on on the podcast, here's a tip. The Monty Roberts University is going through a little bit of an upgrade remodel, too. It's going to be really easy to use on phones. So watch for that. We'll be <gasps> announcing lots of things. Yeah, right here. Oh, mobile and, friendly. Yep. Yeah, we're going to talk to the engineers who are down in Australia and all the work they're putting into it. So, But be sure to visit all the other great shows, too, on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. And until next time, have many happy horse hours. <laughs>